Dear friends and colleagues, well to our webinar for the Lebanese Fertility Society. It's one of multiple webinars that should cover a big part of our specialty. Thanks for IPSA to make it happen today. This evening, we are going to talk about IVF, its history, its evolution. We'll talk about updates and new trends in IVF with the know-how of our best expert in Lebanese Fertility Society. IVF begins in 1890s with Walters in Bridge University for the first plantation in Rabbit. After the 1934, Pincus and Ensman laid the first ovum and fertilized it successfully with a pregnancy. Palmer in 1961 described the first retrieval of ovocytes by laparoscopy. This was the technique before evil. And after the big event was in 1978, Louise Brown was born in England for the first human IVF child. And since that time, IVF continued to evolve. And the old target is to have best quality of embryos, best quality of results and to improve our uh, results in IVF. And in, at the beginning, infertile couples undergo treatment to conceive genetically related child. Now, big changes happen. Since 1990s, we have the opportunity to identify which embryos are affected by chromosomal imbalance or a specific gene disorder. So we can change the gene, and we have the, also the option to have those. In the 1980s, we begin to inject women with gonadotropins, and then we could begin to have controlled ovarian stimulation with multiple ovarian follicles, and improve the pregnancy rate to 23% in 92, in 82, and to 30% in 83. So the first modification was the controlled ovarian stimulation. After this, the important concern of the stimulation was the premature ovulation. For this, we organized things to have a controlled ovulation, a good gearing to have best ovulation we need. Two innovations in 1980s was the agonist and in 2001 was the antagonist. And all this to prevent the premature ovulation and to have better training and a better timing. After this, the problems we have in IVF was the safety of IVF with a control ovarian stimulation. Two big problems. The first was iatrogen because uh, to, uh, we want to improve our chances to have a pregnancy. So we use implanting multiples and we have with this twins and even higher order multiples of fetuses. The solutions was improvements in agriculture technique and all the guidelines regarding the number of embryos to be transferred. The second problem was hyperstimulation. So in 1979, we begin to monitor in controlled ovarian stimulation the serum estradiol and to assess the ovaries with transvaginal ultrasound. With two methods, put patient at risk and allowed physician to take preventive measures. Things new out of antagonist protocols to prevent this kind of complications. Last but not least, we have the luteal phase support with progesterone appears in 19 the best method providing luteal phase support. 
higher life burns and lower risk of ovarian simulation compared to HCG. It could be done orally, intramuscularly, intravaginally, or subcutaneous. What is best? Which dose? When begin? Do we have to increase the dose? When to stop it? All these things will be discussed today in our webinar. What's new in controlled ovarian simulation? What's new in triggering and ovulation? What's new in luteal phase support? All these topics will be discussed in our webinar. Our chairman, Professor Johnny Awad, in obstet professor in obstetric and gynecology and director of AUBMC Fertility Center, will introduce our speakers and will moderate our webinar. Thank you, Rawad. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Vitaya. I'm going to try to share my slides. And I guess, do, do you have my slides already? Not yet. Johnny. Let me try one more time. Okay, I think now we should have them, yes. right? Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Avita, I, I thank you for this presentation. I think that was very important to come back and remember how IVF has started. I think, uh, the courageous people that keep in mind that they've done dozens and dozens of failed cycles on natural cycles before we get there. I think we have to them. It's easy for us to use them, but really the trajectory was really painful initially. But we have everything so easy today. And we I would like to thank our uh, speakers uh, for presenting and updating us on three important topics, relation in IVF, optimal trigger in IVF, and luteal phase support. At the same time, I would like to uh, thank all the people who have connected with us from the whole Middle East region and Europe, including France, UK, uh, including Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, Kuwait, uh, Iraq, um, uh, Lebanon, certainly, United Arab Emirates, uh, Jordan. Uh, this is really a good opportunity together. This is one of the things that, uh, the good thing that COVID has, uh, it brought us together as a scientific community. We'd like to thank um, uh, our industrial uh, uh, partners, IPSA, for, uh, uh, for helping this happen. I would like you a few technical guidances. I would like you to, to know that this uh, meeting is recorded uh, and it will be shared on the Lebanese Fertility Society YouTube channel and the social media platforms for those of us who missed them or our colleagues who would like to come back and review the discussions. Uh, if you have any questions, please make yourself known. Uh, you can always raise a hand on the electronic platform. You can always uh, uh, share a question which I could uh, uh, ask uh, the speakers on your behalf. So please be interactive. However, we're going to keep, we're going to try to keep the questions till the very end. Uh, at this stage, I think it is time to start. We're going to try to stick to time, 20 minutes per speaker, and then the floor will be open for questions. Um, uh, Dr. Elise Neifer is the head of the IVF unit. At at St. George Hospital University Medical Center, one of the eminent IVF and fertility specialists in Lebanon, will be talking about simulation in IVF. Eli, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you uh, for the Lebanese Fertility Society uh, to invite me to talk uh, today with you about uh, ovarian stimulation and to have a brief uh, discussion on different protocols in IVF uh, cycle. I want. Uh, 
Okay. So uh, in IVF stimulation, uh, our aim is uh, uh, essentially to have a sing singleton live birth at term. It's our aim uh, target. And uh, to do that, we should uh, uh, go by many protocols uh, that offer to us uh, the opportunity to decrease the complication and the risk of the treatment. Uh, like decrease uh, multiple pregnancy, decreasing HSS, and the cycle cancellation, like poor response. And have, uh, we have many steps. We have the play stimulation with the stimulation and the protocol, though our site maturation and the luteal phase. Is, but mainly in my topic, I will talk about the different protocol in IVF. As you know, there is not a, uh, a, uh, a best uh, protocol or a king protocol for everybody. We should individualize ovarian stimulation for IVF. And we should always ask the question, what response is optimal? Usually the uh, optimal response in IVF cycle is to have around 10 eggs. Below five eggs, we talk about poor response and behind uh, 20, it's a hyper response. But don't forget that definition of optimal response may vary, it, it, it could change. It could change because of the indication, because of the cases. For example, the optimal response of PCOS, it's not the same of the poor responder or the normal, uh, normal responder. When we have a PGD, when we have outside donor, etc. A brief uh, review about uh, physiology. We know that estrogen had a, has a feedback negative on the axis, the hypothalamus and pituitary axis. And uh, our target to uh, block this axis and uh, to have a down regulation and to introduce uh, the gonadotropin. Uh, we have two big chapters in protocol. We have GNRH agonist and we have the GNRH antagonist. In the GNRH agonist, we have many sub protocol, if you want to say that many other uh, protocols in the, in the agonist, the long protocol, the short protocol, and ultra, uh, ultra short protocol. Here it's a diapo. I think uh, all of you uh, are with it, but it's to, the, to, to uh, describe briefly what's the antagonist protocol and what's the agonist protocol. And the antagonist protocol, after uh, be, uh, be sure that we have a down regulation. We start the gonadotropin uh, at 20 or 225, it's a classical dose if you want. And on day six, it's a, a fixed protocol, we induce the uh, antagonist day. And when we have a, uh, the criteria of triggering, we can uh, uh, introduce the triggering side. That we have the, the retrieval. In the other hand, when we discuss about the agonist, we introduce the agonist in the real phase, seven to eight days after treated ovulation. And we wait till we have a down regulation, and usually this down regulation is reflected by the, the blood, the, the, the show of blood. Uh, and after that, we, we do a uh, ultrasound to be that we have don't have uh, any cyst, we have any, any problem, and we can start the usual dose till the uh, trigger of, uh, of the ovulation. It's very important to have the down regulation, be sure that we have down regulation before the starting the stimulation. Uh, here we, we, you can, sh we, we can uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, effect, the role of GnRH agonist on between them, effect of antagonist on pituitary gland. In the agonist, we have a block uh, of the receptor, but we have uh, initially a, a huge release 
Suppression uh, with stimulation. On we can start. We can we start usually on day five or day six. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, talking about the agonist protocol, we have a regulation of the pituitary gland and the pituitary function. This uh, allowed uh, prevention of premature LH surge until a full or site maturity. And then uh, when we talk about short protocol, what the, what the, what the, uh, try to use the flare up, the flare up of FSH, the huge release of, F, of FSH, uh, Dr. Awad, are you with us? I know I'm with you, but Smaam is small. Yes, I think yeah. Dr. Snaifir was interrupted. Okay. But here, the connection. Oh, so Kamina Anna can I? Okay. So it's his connection, correct? Mm. Yes. Okay. So Diana, out of Hello. Eddie, Hello. Eddie, you're with us. Hey, John. Yes, yes. Us. I don't know. Yes. We lost you. We lost you at one point of time. You were talking about the airport. Okay. So, uh, we are okay. The flare was a short protocol, but don't forget this protocol is good, but we don't, we have some condition to have this protocol. And usually we must have longer cycle. If we have a short cycle and we use short protocol, uh, it's not a good response because we have a quick, uh, quick uh, uh, development of follicle without a uh, thickening of the endometrium. So the, uh, the essential in the flare up of, the, of this protocol, of this short protocol, is to be sure that the cycle is long. It's, it's more than uh, 26, 26 days. If not, it will, uh, it will not uh, work very good. Uh, okay, this is uh, agonist long protocol. We use GNH agonist uh, in the luteal phase, and then we wait till the down regulation, and then we start the stimulation. In a Cochrane review, a single dose depot of GNH agonist preparation, like Lepul, was administered on day 21 of a previous cycle. It was observed that there is no evidence for differences between the long protocol using depot or daily GNH agonist for IVF cycle. So, all we ask, it's better to do with uh, one single dose of GnRH agonist or to do a daily uh, injection. It's not, uh, there's no difference, but I think the compliance of the patient, it's better to have one shot. Uh, for the patient, it's better to not every day take the injection. Uh, 
but don't forget that the use of uh, GnRH depot was associated with increased requirement for gonadotropin and a longer time for patient stimulation. Now, how, uh, when we start, I, I say we should have a down regulation. Uh, how, uh, by definition, how, how we know when we start? So, a stadion must be below 180 picomol, uh, around uh, 50 nanogram, LH below 2, uh, and the progesterone below 2 nanomol, it's uh, below, if you want, 0 cent nanogram. A ultrasound, a pelvic ultrasound must be done to, to rule out uh, uh, the presence of any cyst, any follicular, more than 12 or 15 uh, millimeter. Because if we start with a follicle uh, with high, uh, with, with increased diamine, uh, decrease uh, good response, and we can have a uh, ovarian cyst. Uh, in the the long protocol reduce GnRH uh, agonist uh, three months before the start of gonadotropin. Uh, every month, one dose, uh, for example, of decapil. And uh, we may use this protocol when we have a severe endometriosis or adenomyosis before the treatment. Pregnancy rate uh, appears to be improved in this subgroup of patients. I, I talked before that we should analyze the adenomyosis and in endometriosis and when we have failure of uh, IVF cycle of classical uh, protocol it's very important to think to have a ultra long protocol with inducing uh, uh, GN agonist for three months one injection every month and then go for the uh, stimulation about the antagonist I talk about the antagonist to have the, the, the short the long and the ultra long now about the antagonist antagonist we use the antagonist we have two uh, two protocols we have the flexible uh, one should take in consideration the diameter of the follicle and we introduce the uh, Antagonist when we have a 14 millimeter uh, in mean diameter of the follicle. In the other hand, when we have, uh, we can have the fixed protocol. I use uh, more uh, the fixed protocol because it's more easy. We introduce on day six, five or six. I will introduce on day six uh, daily uh, daily dose uh, of GnRH uh, till triggering until the retrieval, the triggering, and then we have retrieval that six months after. In, uh, uh, in Paris also to use uh, the single dose protocol, uh, it's injection, we don't have this in Lebanon, them, and uh, we introduce it on day seven, and uh, it provides four days of pituitary suppression. You can, you can uh, the multi the doses regimen, and we can see also the single doses uh, regimen. Okay, it's very classical. Now, what's the advantage of the antagonist protocol? Uh, there is many advantage in the antagonist protocol. Uh, 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 significantly shorter. Uh, it's uh, associated with simple uh, stimulation protocol. We have lower dose required. We have a reduced cost, short du duration of injectable drug. We have absence of the symptoms of, of uh, pituitary uh, suppression with uh, a long protocol of agonist. Uh, we have less risk uh, when we introduce it. We have a early pregnancy mis uh, misdiagnosed. Uh, we can avoid the ovarian cyst for. We have a a uh, smooth of gonadotropin and shorter interval between successive cycles. We can also use in this protocol uh, agonist triggering that is very important when we want to freeze and when we want to decrease uh, in PCOS uh, the, the, uh, the eggs or the embryo. It's very important. Uh, uh, don't forget that we have the conventional IVF that I, I talked 
before, but we have other, uh, other, uh, other IVF protocol, mild IVF, it's small dose of IVF, uh, net IVF, and the cycle IVF. Uh, all this, uh, all this uh, cycle have their, their indication in, uh, uh, in in IVF uh, in IVF indication. Um, uh, but when we have breast cancer and we must go uh, to a, a past past history of breast cancer, we can propose nature the cycle IVF, etc. Uh, I will talk quickly about do you do you. It's a, uh, a stimulation uh, of, uh, uh, it's a protocol used uh, uh, normally when you have a, uh, a cancer uh, diagnosis, a breast cancer diagnosis, and we need to freeze uh, of the embryo. We can start a conventional uh, protocol antagonist one. Then when we uh, stop, we stop the four days, and then we start again a new cycle even if we are in the lethal phase, and we can increase the number of oocyte uh, retrieval uh, for this duo uh, stimulation. And in a short period, we can have two, two, two cycles. This is the principle of, uh, of this protocol. Now I will talk briefly, I will talk briefly about the uh, latest guideline uh, 2019 for ovarian uh, IVF stimulation protocol. Uh, we, uh, here, uh, you see in the green the antagonist and in the blue the agonist risk of severe OHSS in the general population. And we note that there is less when we use antagonist protocol and it's significantly uh, important. So when we have uh, when we use antagonist protocol, we have a decrease, a less uh, uh, OHSS, uh, a less severe OHSS than when you use protocol. And, uh, GNRH antagonist protocol is recommended for predicted normal responder women with regards to improved safety. It's a recommendation of Ishri. Uh, here you can see a. a uh, a study H antagonist versus agonist in PCOS and predicted the uh, high uh, responders. Uh, as you see, we have a more advantage. We have a, uh, a more advantage this is, uh, of nine studies that show that the antagonist protocol have a higher ongoing pregnancy rate than the, uh, than the agonist protocol. Uh, in this slide, we, uh, we see that the GNRH antagonist versus agonist in PCOS and predicted the uh, high responder, uh, the risk of OHSS is lower when we use the antagonist protocol, and it's very significant. The other recommendation uh, in PCOS uh, the generation antagonist protocol is recommended for equal efficacy. The generation antagonist protocol is also recommended for predicted response with regards to improved safety and efficacy. The high responders, it's not uh, uh, essentially a polycystic ovary uh, patient. It's a patient a, a huge response because of uh, uh, with other stimulation before. Uh, GNRH agonist uh, versus uh, GNRH antagonist versus agonist long protocol into low response. Uh, this uh, this study. Compare the long agonist versus antagonist protocol and show that in poor response, there is a higher ongoing pregnancy rate when using the antagonist uh, in, in poor, um, in, in, uh, poor responder. Uh, and we use RH antagonist in the other hand here in one use the antagonist versus 
agonist short protocol in predicted low response, we can see that the short agonist protocol uh, in the put response showed higher clinical pregnancy when you use the antagonist protocol. But don't forget, even if we have a low responder, the cycle must be a normal length. If we have a look, with a short length of the cycle, don't use the short protocol. Uh, recommendation, actually also, GN agonists and GH agonists are equally recommended for predicted uh, low responder. Uh, GNRH agonists are used, uh, if GNRH agonists are used, the longer GNRH is probably the of the short and the ultra short agonist protocol. The antagonist protocol is recommended over the GNRH agonist protocol given the comparable efficacy and higher safety in the general IVF population. It's a strong recommendation of HLA. Now, there is other recommendation in this topic. The clomifensitrate alone or in combination with gonadotropin or gonadotropin stimulation alone are equally recommended for predicted poor responder. It's not clear whether a high gonadotropin dose is recommended over 150 units for predicted poor responder. So when we have poor responder, it's important to and to uh, increase the dose of uh, gonadotropin. The gonadotropin dose higher than 300 is not recommended anymore. Before when I have my fellowship, I had my fellowship, we, we go for, for, for and uh, for 50 unit. Now it's not uh, anymore the recommended. At conclusion, as uh, the winner is mainly the antagonist protocol, I don't think so. We should, individualize the treatment for each patient. Don't forget that in PCOS, the antagonist, it's very interesting. It decreases the OHSS, but also keep in mind then the agonist, the long agonist, especially the repo one, one injection or two. It's very important when we have a history of endometriosis or adenomyosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Neifer. It's very informative, very well, nicely put together. I'm sure many of us too are anxious to ask questions, but we're going to keep that till the end of the presentations. And we're going to move with Dr. Ziad Haiter, uh, uh, sir, at the LAU Medical Center Risk Hospital. He's an infertility specialist. Uh, Ziad will be talking about the optimal trigger of final follicle maturation in IVF. Uh, we have used ACC for long. I think uh, we're going to be updated today on some interesting aspects of uh, other forms of trigger. Ziad, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Awad. Uh, thank you, Taya, and for the Lebanese participation to um, inviting me to uh, talk for uh, So uh, the, the, what I'm going to be talking about is the uh, the optimal trigger for uh, IVF. So uh, in the early days of IVF, uh, before using general H agonists and antagonists, uh, there were a lot of cells being cancelled because of mature uh, ovulation due to the surging uh, SLIR. Then with time, the uh, with the introduction of general H agonists later on. In, uh, the early 2000s of the generation antagonists, um, we were able to suppress that population. However, uh, it was found that despite um, uh, not having the LH, the ovulation trigger still deemed to be necessary to have uh, a mature oocyte. So that's why uh, we always now use ovulation trigger. And uh, the human chorionic gonadotropin, the HCG, was the norm for a very long time uh, in ovulation trigger. Now, whenever we talk about an optimal ovulation trigger, we have to think about uh, the patient. So it has to be individualized. Uh, is she at risk for OHSS? Is she, um, uh, did she have 
a pale prior cycle, which have uh, an empty follicle uh, syndrome. So we have to think about it in uh, an individualized manner. Uh, we want it to be effective. We want to, uh, basically to get mature oocytes, uh, 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 no aneuploidy or less aneuploidy, and good light work. It has to be also safe with the low risk of a very happy simulation. But also we want to keep in mind not to reduce the error uh, that the patient may have during these medications. And the side effect obviously have to be the medication. And uh, the, the convenience for the patient, is it easy to administer or not, is also important. So, uh, when we do the uh, ovulation trigger, uh, uh, we are usually using HCG, and, uh, but the other more and more commonly used uh, is a GIH uh, agonist, and the also combinant LH more and more is on Kispeptin. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the Kispeptin particularly, uh, but we're going to talk uh, mostly about the GIH agonist, the uh, HCGs. And then there's the combination, which is the dual trigger, where you get GNRH agonists along with an HCG trigger. So, uh, uh, in this view, the GNRH agonist will work by causing an endogenous surge in the uh, LH and FSA, where HCG, the uh, recombinant LH, will work directly on the LH receptor in the ovary. So the gonadotropin, uh, they have all, all similar subunit and they differ by the beta subunit. And the HCG uh, and the LH have a very similar uh, structure, and their beta subunit is similar. And that's why they are, uh, they, can, they were both bind to the LH receptor. Uh, however, they are not identical. And this is important. Uh, the HCG, uh, when compared to LH, has a high receptor binding affinity at longer time and uh, also a stronger way. And it has a longer half-life, uh, more than 24 hours. The uh, bioequivalency is also a little bit different. The uh, HCG has significant uh, role in activating the cyclic and the serogenesis, and uh, this can have a role also uh, partly in the um, uh, increased risk of ovarian hyperstimulation that can occur following the HCG. The, initially, the HCG uh, was first uh, uh, from urine of pregnant women, and this was actually back in since 1927. So it's been a very long time that we have this uh, in the uh, available. However, there are some that show that there might be some batch-to-batch -batch inconsistencies, and there's also obviously the always some concern about the potential immunological reaction and impurities, some uh, prions and proteins that may be present uh, that uh, that can have an impact on the on a pregnancy with the, uh, some uh, growth factor to be uh, present. Um, however, in 2001, a recombinant the recombinant became more available, and now we have the recombinant HCG that uh, came into market. So this is here a study by Bassett who compared the um, uh, recombinant HCG and the urine HCG and showed that there is a little bit more impurities and protein other than the HCG itself when you uh, when you get the urine HCG now. The, with time, there are more and more uh, pure, uh, and better purification, and uh, therefore these tend to get even better. With, uh, with, uh, now, when, when we compare the urinary HCG, uh, when compared to urinary HCG, the recombinant HCG uh, has probably uh, a higher purity, uh, a better safety profile, um, a lower batch to batch variation, and a higher specific. Uh, this will allow it to be administered in a subcutaneous uh, manner in a people uh, syringe. Uh, and there is no need for a reconstitution and uh, therefore a little bit uh, lower risk of uh, uh, an incorrect dose that is being administered. Uh, but it is more expensive. And the most important for the patient is the clinical advantage. Is there any clinical advantage of using the recombinant? 
So uh, this is called a randomized control trial comparing the uh, 250 milligram of the complex ECG versus 5,000 uh, international of the urinary ECG showed that there is uh, basically uh, no, uh, no real difference okay, between oocyte retrieve and the maturity of the oocyte retrieve. In another randomized control trial by uh, Chang, uh, they tried to see what would be the better dose of the recombinant ECG. Is it better to do 500 versus 250? And this was all compared to the 10,000 uh, unit ECG. In this uh, study, the, uh, the recombinant ECG was associated with significantly higher number of uh, fertilized uh, oocyte and uh, uh, but it was at the cost of an also significantly higher ovarian hyperstimulation and was seen in percent of the patient versus 3.2%. So based on this uh, study, the decision was that we should really not go to 500 recombinant ECG and to stick with the 250 uh, recombinant uh, HCG uh, it won't be better or the urinary ECG. Now, some people say, why 5,000, why 10,000? Now, this is, the initial ECG was around 8,500 when they first uh, uh, started using it. And, uh, and uh, they were, I'm not gonna go into the detail of this, but it seemed to be uh, adequate. And uh, I think you, know, you should be careful about the BMI of the patient uh, when uh, deciding sometimes uh, the, uh, uh, the dose. And if she's uh, not at an increase of, uh, uh, OHSS, then you can also now. So what we're trying to uh, so although the recombinant ACG may have some uh, 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 and maybe easier to administer. Uh, so uh, the important thing for the patient is really whether uh, it is going to get her to get pregnant. And this is here a, uh, when you look at the, the uh, Cochrane review by uh, Yusuf et al. 2016, uh, you will see that uh, basically there is no uh, significant improvement um, uh, between the common ACG and, and urine ACG. Look at the, uh, in the long and in the, the top part of the, uh, uh, of the chart, of the graph, you will see when they're using long genage agonist protocol, and there is really no difference in all the studies. And the study then it was involving the GNRH and diagnosis protocol uh, and evaluating lab work rate. And, they, and here you can see that it is uh, you know, maybe favoring, but it is really, you cannot call it statistically. So if they are, having similar uh, the pregnancy outcome, how about the uh, uh, main risk with, uh, with IVF, which, which is the ovarian hypersimulation. And when you look at ovarian hypersimulation syndrome, uh, between mild and moderate cases, you see that there is no difference between uh, the recombinant or the urinary HCG. Now, when we look at the side effect, there is some uh, side effect when we are using the recombinant HCG versus the urinary HCG. But please note that the side effect that we are talking about here is basically the, uh, uh, the site of the injection. So it's really not something that is extremely uh, uh, important uh, you know, when we're making the decision. So, out of 18 random mass control trials involving almost 3,000 women, we can conclude that there is a difference of a difference between the recombinant HCG and urinary HCG regarding the ongoing pregnancy and live birth rate and the clinic pregnancy rate, miscarriage, or the incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation. There is some increase in the number of retrieved oversight. This will not be uh, of significant value if the pregnancy rate of increases. And there is a reduction in the incidence of low blood saturation. The recombinant HCG, the 250 microgram, is equivalent to a 6,500 uh, of the urinary HCG international. With the timing of registration, um, it, 
if you do the retrieval too close to the time of the uh, trigger, uh, it might be difficult to separate the oocyte from the tumors and from the, uh, from the other side. It might also not as uh, and ultimately, uh, yeah, you know, the, if you go to 35, 36 hours uh, after the trigger, this is a more optimal. There is always some concern that uh, doing a retrieval too late after uh, might lead to a, a premature inoculation and therefore inability to get any oocyte. But there are uh, several studies show that you can even do retrieval even later than. 38 hours, 40 hours, and you can still get uh, uh, OSI. Now, uh, if we, and, uh, so this was pretty much what we always used to use. Now, in the more recent days, especially uh, the uh, more, uh, uh, more people, more physicians using now the GNLH antagonist protocol, uh, not, we have now another option to use as a trigger. So uh, this is the GnRH agonist. Uh, before we continue, LH agonist, when it will uh, stimulate, this is how the LH uh, level uh, will be, the serum LH level. So the GnRH agonist in blue will lead to a rapid increase in the LH level and then a decline versus the natural LH surge, which will be uh, increased, a small plateau and then a decline. And that will be around 48 hours of LH presence. And then the HC, which will be uh, for a longer time and up to uh, six to seven days in the system. The GIH um, uh, agonist, there are several types. Now, let's um, find what will be those. So, uh, Luperlet is commonly used in the US, okay, and uh, and uh, the doses typically uh, from 0 0.5 to 4 milligram are all uh, have been shown to be equal. Triptor, uh, which is more common in uh, our area, okay. Uh, uh, at, uh, there are some studies that compare, they study compared the uh, triptorolin at 0 0.2 milligram, 0 0.3 and 0 0.4. And there's no difference in any of the outcomes that we measure. And therefore, if there's no difference, then we should use the 0 0.2 uh, to uh, avoid any uh, potential side effect. So, the GIH agonist will look uh, uh, here, uh, like in, uh, in the study of uh, Galindo, it showed that uh, if you use GIH agonist versus the recombinant HCG in an oversight donation cycle, there were no difference between the number of cycles of metacide, the number of fertilizers. So uh, this is excellent for the uh, uh, what the outcome when we talk about the oocyte. And similarly, octane when uh, the, uh, doing a study in fertility observation, uh, uh, it also showed that the lupulite acetate uh, did not have a network. Uh, Outcome actually, uh, they had a similar number of oocytes, and even they had a greater number of mature oocytes, and even higher fertilization rate when he compared GNH agonist lucrolide at one milligram compared to uh, uh, urinary HCG. However, uh, in this situation, there were oocyte uh, donation and fertility preservation, so there was no, uh, we're not putting back. So what about the pregnancy outcome? So again, this is a similar uh, figure to the one I showed you earlier uh, about the uh, uh, impact of the uh, GnRH the LH activity and LH in the body. So with the GnRH agonist, you see that within 28 hours, you already have a very low LH activity. So this is uh, much shorter than the natural uh, uh, and also uh, much shorter than the uh, LH activity that occurs following a HCG trigger. So uh, this has been an issue and this in a reason the H agonist uh, trigger have been uh, associated with a lower uh, pregnancy. Now 
uh, if we believe that this is all due to a new phase problem, or, uh, some people claim that it might be also due to the GnRH agonist uh, action on the endometrium. Okay, uh, completely maybe independent from the nuclear phase. Okay, so and those who believe that it is due to the nuclear phase, they do uh, give a modified nuclear phase, and this uh, will compensate potentially for a least pregnancy uh, from the genes. So in this uh, Cochrane review here, you can see that the, uh, the HCG group, okay, had a uh, uh, better uh, uh, per woman randomized, okay, versus the GnRH agonist. Okay, so the HCG is the, on the left of the vertical line, and so this is a, uh, a higher life birth rate per woman randomized by GnRH And statistically significant. Similarly, the ongoing pregnancy rate per woman randomized was also in favor of the HCG group. And, uh, but please, not sorry, I go back to show you this is fresh autologous cycle, while this is in donor cycles. So, uh, when you look at fresh cycle, you see that it is significantly um, better with the HCG, but when you look at the cycle, there is no difference from the live birth rate, and similarly for the ongoing pregnancy rate, it is also not, not when you look at the cycles. So uh, uh, the miscarriage rate is also here higher uh, for the GnRH. So again, another uh, worse outcome uh, for the GnRH agonist. But when you look at the data, it is not the incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation, uh, as expected, is higher with the HCG group. And uh, uh, here, uh, a brief summary of the uh, what we spoke about about the GnRH agonist. So, for fresh cycle, it is associated with a decreased life birth rate, a decreased ongoing pregnancy rate, and an increased spontaneous miscarriage. In the donor recipient cycle, where you are uh, where you are using agonist, there is no difference in the ongoing pregnancy rate or early spontaneous miscarriage. And these are typically with donor recipient, but also they can be with the fertility preservation cycle and uh, whenever we want to do a, a freeze all uh, cycle. Okay. So, uh, and in any uh, time, it is always associated with the lower. Ovarian hyperstimulation. Now, now age, uh, uh, this is, you know, you would assume that this should be the best one from because it is a LH, and so uh, it is uh, going to be really mimicking the most the natural uh, solution. However, uh, the, it was not as uh, great and. Uh, and uh, when they look at the, uh, the, a large multi-center trial involving 22 centers, with, like, they look almost at 250 uh, uh, women. And uh, they used the cause of the age, they used uh, uh, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 30,000. Uh, and they found out that the pregnancy rate were significantly uh, better when, uh, when basically the, uh, uh, the higher dose of complement LH, and also she got a boost, okay, another dose at three days later. If they did not do that, they did not have as good as pregnancy uh, outcome. Um, and, uh, and they do a lower HSS. Now, if they do the uh, higher dose and the, uh, and the additional dose later on, the, and that study, the pregnancy rate was not that great, it was also around 20% when you looked at it. So now there is peptin and kispeptin. I'm not gonna talk about it today, okay? But uh, there is so basically we spoke about the HCG, uh, the recombinant, and the urinary, and we spoke about the uh, GnRH agonist, recombinant. Now, uh, when we talk about ovulation fever, we have to talk about something called the empty follicle syndrome. This was found in 1986 
uh, when they uh, doing a major F cycle, uh, they realize that they didn't have any um, over cycle three uh, side division having uh, of this particle. So this could be due to a uh, failure uh, due to a patient not using. So sometimes a woman could be uh, just putting the uh, uh, the solution, not putting actually the medication. Okay, she, uh, they may have not uh, given the dose, or the, 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 or uh, she took another medication. Okay, so uh, this and uh, we uh, uh, end up in a situation like this. I think you should uh, do a, uh, a test. Um, if the patient had an HCG trigger, then you have to check for uh, HCG because the patient would not have HCG in uh, in her system unless she got it. And if she got a GnRH act trigger. Then the HCG will not stop because uh, she didn't take it, and the, so the way to detect it would be by doing a uh, LH uh, test. Um, and the, if the LH is elevated, then she did take it. Because this is how we're going to categorize the sometimes patient whether this is a true empty follicle syndrome or a false. The false empty follicle syndrome means when the patient did not do the right dose or missed the medication, and these are uh, cases that uh, will be probably easier to. And uh, the causes that can happen, so human error that we spoke, but sometimes with a very high mind, sometimes the surge in that age is not significant. And uh, so that's why we sometimes have to use a larger dose of medication. Uh, some people may have a missense LH receptor mutation, and those people have recurrent MP follicle, and sometimes you can have it in MD. And then it is also very important if you have a low baseline LH level. Uh, these are very important when we're going to do an H agonist If you have somebody with very low baseline and H level, and you're going to come and do an H agonist trigger, you may end up with an empty follicle syndrome. And this is sometimes if somebody has been on OCP and prolonged suppression, or let's say they have a hypothalamic or hypogonadism, so given this maybe, and so sometimes you may think that she has, and this is important because uh, I think many times we people decide to use uh, GnRH agonist trigger in a patient with PCOS, okay, because we are worried about ovarian hyperstimulation. So you come and you do the GnRH agonist and you find out that you have an empty follicle syndrome. But what could be the case is that maybe what we thought was uh, PCOS was actually not a PCOS, but more like a lemic and hypoantipotary uh, problem. And so this situation will be, uh, we can lead to that. So this is something to keep in mind. Uh, uh, when, when we get this so, so, and the last uh, few slides I'm going to talk about is about the dual trigger. So, the dual trigger, uh, as you see in this um, figure, in the yellow uh, range, in the, in the yellow bar uh, on day 14, you see the blue uh, spiking is the LH, but then you can see also that the orange uh, that's also on that at that time is the FSH. And so far, uh, you know, we spoke pretty much about the LH. Now, the JH agonist does have uh, some FSH effect as well. Um, and so the, uh, in this situation, uh, there is some that, uh, people advocate that an FSH is, is important because the FSH can promote formation of LH receptors in the luteinizing granulosa cells, uh, nuclear maturation, and maturation and cumulus expansion. And uh, so this has been uh, one of the first studies was, uh, uh, well, there was one by Yankee who accidentally, the patient took FSH, recombinant FSH, instead of taking HCG. And what uh, happened is that they thought that she would not uh, have mature oversight. She did have mature oversight and she did have fertilization. She did not get pregnant, but basically uh, FSH alone was uh, not uh, uh, detrimental for the cycle. Uh, in uh, a study by, uh, by LAMP in 2011, uh, they looked at uh, 450 recombinant FSH, uh, 10,000 of unary HCG, and versus just unary HCG. And they found out that a, uh, the, there was a significantly improved outcome uh, when the uh, uh, medication Third, uh, clinical pregnancy rate and the live pregnancy, although they are maybe better here in the stable, there were 
not uh, significant, um, statistically significant. So uh, uh, finally, uh, Ding uh, uh, last year did a meta-analysis, including uh, 527 uh, women from uh, uh, four randomized uh, trials to see if the dual trigger, you know, trigger the, these studies were involving uh, GnRH agonists, so triptoralin and ACG or, uh, or uh, lupulide and ACG versus HCG uh, by itself. There was no difference of oversight, mature oversight, zygote, or implantation day. Uh, however, there was an increase in the in the GnRH supplemented group compared to the HCG alone. So uh, this is a, uh, a very important conclusion in the study. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, that's why many people now are moving into the dual trigger. Uh, I'm not going to mention it, but people were doing that also for cases where they were a poor responder or did not have a good outcome. Uh, some of the studies were, were using historical control. So, they are not very good studies, you know, like somebody who did the company the CG did not work and they did uh, both together uh, and they did, but many things can change, uh, you know, so it is not uh, ideal. But these are the randomized control trials and this was the uh, uh, summary. So the additional FSH exposure is probably helpful to enhance the oocyte uh, and uh, the maturation of the oocyte, uh, but, the, but the most important thing, obviously, it's still the HCG and, uh, and uh, when we're doing a fresh cycle. So uh, we really should not just do GnRH agonist alone for a fresh cycle, unless we are uh, manipulating the nuclear phase, um, but the HCG is going to be important. Uh, so in conclusion, when we want to uh, uh, use a novulation trigger, uh, we want to have uh, in mind uh, the the best medication to get mature oocyte. This is always when we lead studies about ovulation trigger, they also talk about the percent of maturity of the oocyte as uh, uh, when you go like, you know, based on the number of follicles that, that you have oocyte. And the uh, mutual phase characteristics, predicting the implantation, and obviously risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. As well. Thank you. Siad, on behalf of uh, all the participants, I'd like to thank you. The very comprehensive, very uh, elaborate, and lots of valuable references. Thank you very much. We move to the next speaker, Dr. Ahmed Abu Jaudi, uh, who is the head of the IVF unit at the Abu Jaudi Hospital, and who will be discussing a luteal phase support, uh, progesterone, and beyond. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Johnny. Thank you, uh, George, uh, for this uh, very nice and attractive meeting and uh, this uh, confinement. Uh, <laughs> we discovered <laughs> how we can meet uh, staying at home or in our uh, our uh, uh, workplace. So uh, now we will continue what. Uh, uh, the star and uh, they had uh, to to continue the cycle in this uh, luteal phase, uh, luteal phase report. So uh, Eli, uh, uh, compare you the different protocol that you are using and the uh, uh, to uh, to get uh, to uh, uh, to to have the eggs. I have some problem. So the uh, progesterone supplementation. The role of the progesterone, we will talk about the role of the progesterone, the implantation, the luteal phase deficiency in IVF, and then we'll talk about the luteal phase support in frozen embryo transfer, and then we'll conclude. So why you use progesterone? You, know, you all know that progesterone will induce transformation of the endometrium, the decidualization, and it will prepare for you the uterine receptivity. It have also a modulatory effect. It will increase NO production and uh, doing vasodilatation and uterine uh, musculature. 
and uh, it's very important to have the progesterone until seven weeks uh, uh, of uh, until seven weeks not you will have a pregnancy loss the immunomodulatory effect uh, it will uh, actually you know the cytokine is very important so it will it will uh, take the uh, it will form the inflammatory cytokine the corpus luteum it's an organ that uh, have an endocrine uh, effect and it's provisory because it will stop only on this luteal phase and in the beginning of the pregnancy uh, the transformation of the granulosa and the theca cells which are stimulated by the lh the active during luteal phase and the early pregnancy until eight weeks the progesterone level should be around 20 nanogram by milliliter during their phase uh, this mid luteal phase for those who don't do enough uh, uh, obstetrics and who are fanatic of uh, of uh, progesterone, actually, there is a very recent uh, recent uh, meta, uh, study uh, by uh, the the group of uh, Kumarasi in 2020, recently published, and they compare in the recurrent miscarriage that there is no need for progesterone. Okay, it's the same with placebo, so don't use progesterone in all your recurrent pregnancy. It have only 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 a place. When you have a recurrent, uh, a recurrent more than three, uh, three miscarriage, the progesterone for supporting the phase is interest. In another study by the same authors, uh, doing taking all the all the randomized study and the evidence, and it shows only a very interesting effect in the patient who have more than three recurrent miscarriage, and there is a place for progesterone in this place in uh, during the pregnancy. For the implantation, the implantation there is uh, the progesterone have uh, it will do the prepare the window of implantation. The timing and the onset is, is very important when the progesterone will start. Once the progesterone is reached, the window will open for several days and then it will stop. So if we look here in the natural cycle, you will have your LH, you will have your ovulation, and you have a window plantation was ready for the embryos and during the stimulation what happened sometimes there is an elevation of the progesterone before hcg and your window of implantation will move little bit it will occur during this uh, this time so there is a, a, a decalage during the stimulation and ovarian stimulation cycle so this is why sometimes we have no pregnancy during ivf because your wind plantation is destabilized and there is a desynchrony. And if we uh, look to the, the study of Jones in 1996, uh, when you have a natural cycle, and uh, Zia showed it uh, in his slides, the, L, uh, the progesterone will, in, will uh, increase in a normal cycle, it will decrease very late. When you have an hyperstimulated cycle, your progesterone will go higher and then will go quickly uh, quickly back. So uh, this is the problem of the uh, the, the lack of progesterone in the luteal phase after stimulation. The theory why we why we have a, a decrease a quick decrease during IVF. The theory after this is maybe because we remove the cells of the granulosa, and maybe uh, the, of because when you use agonist you will block your LH FSH. And recently, also, there is an antagonist uh, with antagonist protocol. We have also the same effect. And when you induce with SCG, you will suppress your L release and mention of all these uh, factors. When you use your long agonist protocol, this is the natural luteal phase. With the long agonist protocol, you have a decrease, a decrease uh, of uh, the progesterone. And uh, if you don't give progesterone, you will have a quicker decrease of your progesterone. In the antagonist protocol, if you, sti if you, uh, if you stimulate the, with HCG, you will have a, 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 there is more progesterone and it will decrease later. If you use your recombinant, you will have a decrease very early. And if you use nothing, you use NLH, you will have a very low increase of progesterone. You see the difference 
and also an antagonist, we have the same problem. So there is a lack of progesterone. The recommendation, if you go to the X-ray, progesterone is re recommended for luteal support after IVF. A strong recommendation. This means because there is a, a well-randomized study and all these recommendations are based on the meta-analysis doing by Ren Leiden in 2015 when that which is during the luteal phase may be associated with a higher rate of live births and ongoing pregnancy than placebo or no treatment. Okay, which route you will give your progesterone? Vaginal, rectal, intramuscular, subcutaneous, uh, any of the previously mentioned administration route, non-oral, non for natural progesterone as luteal phase support can be used. This is GPP, it's not strong, but any, all are, the, they are based on the meta-analysis of Van Leiden, uh, in 2015 with Metwally. Uh, here I show you only the IM and the vaginal uh, route. There is no difference if you use intramuscular or vaginal projects. Uh, most of the center, this is a publication in 2012, most of the center in the world, uh, review of all the stimulation call in the world, you can see that the vaginal route is uh, uh, around 70%. Vaginal and I 15%, only, only I am progesterone 15%, and those with SCG is very low. Oral progesterone only 2%, and uh, the rest. So most centers in the world use vaginal progesterone, and uh, very few use uh, I am progesterone. This is the, the common practice. Uh, when you have to start your progesterone, Starting the progesterone luteal phase should be in the window between the evening site retrieval till the day post all site retrieval. Why they say this? Because there is a meta analysis by Conwell in 2010, and he took the study. This is the same study by, uh, by different authors. There is five papers one, two, three, four, five. And the one who showed the pregnancy, one from Jens, who had the progesterone after day four. And we see here a decrease in the pregnancy rate. The other study will start before CG, before CG, the day after. There is the same pregnancy rate. This study shows also the same pregnancy the day zero or the day or two. So there is a start here. So never start after day three of uh, uh, after the uh, the pickup. Okay. So uh, progesterone. When you have to stop your progesterone, you go on, should be uh, progesterone for luteal phase support should be administered at least, at least until the day of pregnancy test. But this is what not everybody do. Why they say this? Because uh, two brand study uh, taken by a meta-analysis by Liu, and uh, they showed there is no difference if you stop your progesterone support at day 15 on the day of HCG positive test, or if you continue your progesterone until, uh, until eight weeks. So there is no difference. But what people do, most of the people, 80% in Asia continue until 10, 12, uh, 12 weeks. Uh, 60, 66% they continue until uh, in New in the, in, uh, in USA, most of the people continue until uh, 10 to 12 weeks. This is in 2012. The dosing, this is uh, interesting. Uh, what dose? So if you use your antacular you have to use 50 milligram. If you use the subcutaneous, you use 25. Genal progester gel, 90, 90 milligram. If you use the micronized 200 milligram three times a day, and if you use the micronized vaginal progesterone in such repository, uh, 200 milligram and 400 milligram for the pessary twice, uh, twice. So this is uh, uh, these are two doses. To decrease your dose. If you don't give enough progesterone, you have a lower pregnancy rate. Uh, this has been shown by Asli in, uh, when he checked the progesterone during the luteal phase. And if progesterone is less than 17 grams, you will have lower pregnancy rate compared to those who have more than 17 uh, milligrams. So 
it's better to have a higher progesterone. So now we will do another very important, interesting and important. This is a little phase in frozen embryo transfer. And frozen embryo transfer, and we have when you have a, a, an artificial cycle, you have no progesterone from the so all the progesterone you give is from your uh, from your side. So how we prepare our uh, frozen uh, embryo cycle, you can use the natural cycle, the uh, uh, HRT, the natural or all these have been and the many randomized study and meta-analysis have been done and they didn't show any difference. So the problem is here when you do progesterone in uh, HRT cycle, when it is completely uh, artificial. And when you have to start the day of uh, transfer or before and you have you adjust your progesterone in case of lack of progesterone so, so when we talk about fresh uh, about frozen embryo uh, cycle you have to put yourself as if you pick up you do the pick up here you consider this is day zero, and if you want to transfer you start at day zero and you add day one day two day three day four day five as if your blastocyst is Five. You are the day of pickup and your days of progesterone. You can also start one day later. Uh, many studies didn't show any difference that as the day zero or day one. And you should not delay it more than one day because you will have a decrease of your progesterone. And some start, so sometimes it's better, sometimes it's not. So we'll, we'll see all this now. Uh, this is the Kosh of Gobara, and uh, uh, there is no difference between different cycle and different preparation. So most of the people are using the, uh, the natural cycle, but if you have a regular cycle, you're obliged to use the, uh, the HRT cycle. So when you use your HRT cycle, the dose, why it's important. If milligram, if you use uh, I am progesterone 50 milligram every three days plus vaginal uh, plus vaginal progesterone. Or if you use only vaginal progesterone, you will have a decrease of your. So it's better sometimes to use intramuscular or uh, or intramuscular plus vaginal. So in this study of Divine in 2018, if you have a low progesterone, you will have a lower. So this is a, a review recently, uh, since Jovic in 2015, he, he showed that when you have a HRT cycle and using, he used the vaginal progesterone and using the pessary, if the progesterone is less than 15, you have a decrease in pregnancy rate. And uh, many people, many people, especially the people of uh, EV in Spain, they have made they make two studies on big numbers using uh, the utrogestin here. And uh, they show also if the progesterone, the day of the transfer are less than 10 or 9 pounds, you have a decrease in pregnancy rate. And this is very important because 25% of your patient to 30% have a decrease in progesterone when you use only uh, the va uh, vaginal progesterone. Okay? So... Uh, so, so the problem, uh, problem do cancel your cycle or you continue? We'll see it here. Uh, the French people, Cedra was uh, try to increase the vaginal progesterone. It doesn't work because your progesterone will not increase. They move 100 milligrams daily to 200. That means. Uh, so they didn't have an increase of your progesterone. So there is a maximum vaginal progesterone. So recently in the ESHRAE 2019, the last uh, last summer, last uh, last, ESHRAE, Labarta uh, show take two group the the patient who have lo higher uh, more than nine uh, nanogram, and she com continue with the same dose, 800 milligram daily. And those who have less than nine, uh, nine uh, nanograms, so they do a rescue due the day of uh, transfer or day five. They add 
the 25 milligram osocutaneous progesterone. What happens? So they get the same pregnant. So this is very important. They call it the new strategy. And this is what we are doing actually in the donor eggs and, the, and in our uh, frozen embryo. We do a progesterone transfer and the, if the progesterone is less than nine or 10, we go to add the, uh, the, uh, the prolitex uh, to, uh, to have a higher progesterone. Okay, and to have the progesterone. Progesterone is crucial for implantation and early pregnancy maintenance. Luteal phase support in GnRH uh, uh, agonist and antagonist are uh, uh, mandatory. Controversy regarding stopping uh, luteal phase in F is still here. The evidence, you can stop it, but most of the people don't do it. Vaginal progesterone in worldwide is the most used uh, luteal phase support. Oral progesterone can offer a more patient patient, but now there is a very few studies who show, uh, who show an uh, important, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 an importance. If you use uh, uh, for all embryo transfer in HRT, like progesterone supplementation is mandatory. You should start day zero, the day of oven pickup, the pseudo oven pickup, or day one, not more. And progesterone supplementation in natural cycle uh, during frozen is probably useful when luteal phase report is suspected. So you can do your progesterone if it's less than 10, you can add progesterone. If the progesterone is more than 10, no need to add progesterone in natural cycle. You can have less than five, uh, around 5% 5 to 8% patients have low progesterone, they have little defect in natural cycle. Thank you for it. Uh, thank attention. you very much on behalf of everyone. I think it's great. I think uh, very informative. And um, we move to the uh, either QA or to raising hand and going directly live. So I can see uh, Dr. Wajiha uh, had a question. Dr. Wajiha Jaber, uh, please go ahead. If you can unmute yourself and uh, ask the question live. Okay. okay, we're going to move to Dr. Faiz Bitar. Dr. Faiz. Dr. Faiz, Peter, are you with us? Hello. Yes. I don't have the question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> the echo man, that means it was uh, clear and perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Waji Hajaber, we're listening to you. If you have any question, please come forward. Johnny. Hi, Dr. Tony. Thanks. I got the answer. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Great. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Good thank to you. have you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks. So, any questions? Um, please go ahead and uh, either post them on Q&A. And our I speakers... Have, I have a question will be to Ziyad. To Ziyad. Yes, sure. Uh, Ziyad. You, you you show us that uh, there is a decrease in pregnancy rate when you use agonist uh, uh, for uh, and of the ovulation, but uh, for but uh, uh, recently Hamidan showed that if you add one thousand five hundred ECG, you will get the same pregnancy rate. Uh, you didn't show us uh, this is what we are doing today, and we have uh, we found exactly. But what's your opinion? Correct. So uh, if you if you're gonna add the uh, a low dose of ACG, then you will compensate for the uh, premature luteolysis luteal of the corpus luteum if you just give GnRH agonist. So if you give GnRH agonist the, the trigger and in a fresh cycle, you need to use uh, you use a uh, small uh, 
additional dose CG. You can also add uh, uh, estrogen and uh, uh, progesterone as well, like you know, do a modified uh, PPL uh, uh, phase. Ziad, uh, do you mind if I, I make a little comment? Uh, it's a very nice uh, uh, review or a uh, systematic review or actually a uh, meta-analysis just last year other than the Cochrane review which looked at all the data that are there and it looks like even when you give the ACE rescue uh, the overall is associated with a slightly higher but significantly higher miscarriage rate and lower life birth but at any rate I mean even with this this is a very safe protocol considering the proper indications and it is certainly not used at least at this stage to replace ACG in normal responders or poor responders, but it has its uses and considering the pros and cons, uh, this difference um, may be compensated by by safer IVF outcome. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, yeah, I agree completely. Um, Eli, uh, I have a question for you. Do you use the friend? Do you find any uh, use for it now that we have the antagonist protocol? Uh, thank you, John, for the question. Uh, in practice, now don't use any more of the, the flare protocol. Uh, I had used it when I was in Paris uh, at the service of Dr. U Uc for the <clears throat> ovarian responder, but put responder in two groups. One group with the length of the cycle, small, a short length of the cycle, we use the antagonist, and the other group, uh, the uh, length of the cycle, and we used um, uh, the short protocol. Uh, but uh, now, uh, since uh, four or five years, I don't use it anymore, the flare. I think it practice places more advantage on uh, antagonists. Right. Uh, when when I, I need to use it, if I had a history of um, echappement of uh, to then have a uh, past uh, history of uh, uh, failure of antagonist with uh, LH surge, uh, LH surge. I can use it if I need to 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 be quick or uh, I don't have time for that. Maybe I'm gonna make a comment if you agree with that. The um, FAIR protocol was introduced in the past by the uh, uh, Jones Institute, and that was really their baby. On as it turned out to be, uh, it does not increase the risk, the uh, chances of having more, more, more eggs. So there's no increase in the number of eggs. The only advantage is less uh, ampules utilized, but also it, it, is a, it is associated with a lower endometrial receptivity and therefore live birth. So in the presence of the antagonist protocol, I think uh, it's value of more of a hysteric value, if you read. Now, after that, we want to move to a question by Dr. Khaldun Khmeisi. You are live. Uh, hi, Johnny. Hi. Hi, Khaldun. Can you hear me? Of course, we're all hearing Big you. Hello for you and your colleagues for a um, nice uh, webinar. Thank you, Khaldun. Um, I'm uh, best regards from Jordan. My question is about, do you guys check the LH level in antagonist protocol cycles? You know, in some cases, we, we get this bonus. We get um, an LH sort of rise rather than surge. And that in itself might compromise that cycle. So do you sort of check it? I mean, I know some people don't check LH. So can you tell me? So your question uh, for the GM. Do you check the LH level in, in, in antagonist in cycles? Antagonist cycles. <clears throat> Serum do not. Ziad or, uh, or Eli, do you have any answers? I, 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 st I often do lab work, and uh, I think if you are, uh, uh, sometimes if you have a, a poor responder, for example, or the advanced maternal age, 
they sometimes might, ha might have a premature uh, rise in, the, in age, and they may need to, uh, you know, sometimes you may need to double the dose of ciprotide until she gets ready, for example. So I use it in this situation, in this protocol, uh, I mean, uh, and especially at the beginning, they are very, you know, if we pre if we prime them, they will be, you know, very suppressed, so it might be misleading, and uh, but that's what. The main, the <clears throat> excuse me, I, can I say uh, something? Yes, that's fine. Uh, the main problem is uh, with the antagonist is uh, premature the LH surge and the cancellation. Uh, talk what we uh, call in, in in Paris in France échappement. They they they. Uh, we have a premature edge. Uh, when uh, we used uh, to to do when with every hormone monitorage or LH progesterone and uh, estradiol, but uh, now because uh, financially we we don't use it. Uh, and because to, to decrease uh, the LH surge, I use two injections per day. Because I have many cases, I use, for example, Sprotid one injection. I have many échappements, many LH pre, uh, surge. So what I'm doing now, I ask for Ostradiol, and um, I don't ask anymore for progesterone or LH. I, I give two, one in the morning, one in the evening. Uh, it's only for financial uh, financial problem because LH is it's it's costly. Now the advantage to do the LH is in some in some cases when we have LH uh, increase of LH and progesterone it's uh, it's uh, still very very low. We can block the LH surge and we can continue the the uh, the the cycle. So it's it's a cuisine. Say uh, it's it's not there is not a clear cut on this. It's a case by case. But I I can uh, give you my small experience. If you want to use in Lebanon antagonist, don't hesitate to use two two injection with uh, mm -hmm. with uh, with sp sp uh, with uh, delay time between one in the morning one in the evening. What do you think, Ziad? Yeah, I usually do. LH, uh, so uh, give them, to, uh, but that's but exactly uh, to your point. Uh, you know, like in general antagonists, and especially if they are poor responder, they might uh, uh, prematurely uh, have an LH surge. So uh, that's why I, I check the situation, and uh, I often do give them uh, uh, like uh, two doses. And uh, and uh, so. yeah, my impression is that Khaldun may be asking. Uh, LH level at the start of the cycle, not at, on the day of trigger. Khadun, am I right? No, actually, Johnny, I, I was asking exactly uh, Ziad and uh, my other league were saying I it's see. actually during the stimulation, okay. just okay. before the trigger. So, thank you. Very, very clear answers. And the um, of the good work, guys. And regards thank, you. thank you, thank you, Dr. Khaldun. Dr. Khaldun is now the president of the Jordan. Thank you, George. Yes. So yes. happy to be us. Thank, Thank you. you, George. It's always nice to see you, George. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Thank presidents, Eli, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I would be a bit worried about playing two, two uh, of cetratide or ganyan relics closer to uh, 24 hours apart, right? This, we do not have studies to support that, but I want you to go back to the European and those finding studies on general H agonists. And they found out that 0 0.25 was the per day, was the one associated with the best outcome. As they increased the dose, the implantation rate got Z, right? And so sometimes those through this closer uh, backup could maybe push us through a lower implantation rate. So I would suggest to keep it 24 as per indication. The only thing is that if you which has a safety margin of 24 hours only, Ganya Relics has a safety margin of 36 hours, right? So then the, probably you'd need to do it on the morning of the ACG in or on the morning of the ACG. 
uh, and I, and you're right, uh, uh, general age agonists in general are not as powerful as we think in preventing premature age surges. It is really the high supraphysiologic level of estradiol that does most of the job. That's why when we have normal responders or hyper responders, you rarely see them undergoing an LH surge or premature ovulation, right? Uh, and, and, uh, premature ovulation. Whereas with poor responders, because low estrogen, you're depending essentially on the GRH antagonist. This is where the failures happen. And that's why particularly on these patients, the best would be to give it the morning of the trigger, right? But I would be a bit worried if we don't have studies on that. Uh, that's, that's the, problem, just... the problem when we have premature uh, surge in traffic, it's not in the morning of the triggering. It's normally on day seven, eight. In the second, it, it's before the, 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 the maturity of the follicles. This is uh, our problem. Uh, Practically, I'm not very, uh, very fan of the antagonist, except in your PCOS, because especially in Lebanon, when we uh, cancel a, a cycle, it's a big problem, financial problem. It's a, I, uh, I, I, I'm more than uh, for, for agonists, for agonist protocol with, uh, with uh, depot, if you want. But, um, uh, what do you think about the dose? We have the, uh, the experience of Cetrotid 3 that is, uh, we used always in Paris, and they show with Olivan, I think, uh, because uh, they, 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 they speak about this. Uh, there is no difference between the Cetrotid 3 milligram, one shot for every three days, and the uh, 0 0.25 daily. Now in Lebanon, we don't have the 3 milligram. Uh, I think uh, it's very important if can to do a gesterone and stadion when we when we have uh, antagonist protocol because we can we can uh, if you want uh, accelerate to introduce if we have uh, LH surge beginning of LH surge to decrease for the progesterone increase uh, and if we cannot do the hormone test I think it will be an option to do to to to, to injection, or to, if you want to do, uh, not every 24 hours, every eight, uh, 20 hours, if, if you want, uh, four hours before, or uh, hours before. Uh, Thank you very much. Eli, El, Elias Karam, how are you, Dr. Karam? Do you want to unmute yourself and share your question? Elias? Yes, we can. Johnny, there is two questions for Dr. Abu Jaudi. Yes. From uh, one from Laura Hashan and the other, hello, I will see. Uh, the first of um, uh, what about lactobacillus through the vagina during the window of implantation? And the second question is, what about from uh, Dr. C. What about est uh, adding estrogen during the luteal phase support, uh, during the um, stimulation, if there is a thin endometrial lining? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the, the problem of lactobacillus is not in this uh, meeting. It wasn't on the program. But uh, uh, yes, we, we do a study that is present at the MEFs uh, last year. And we show that uh, in the patient who have lack of lactobacillus, um, lactobacillus there is an increase in pregnancy rate. Uh, second question for those who have cell endometrium. And uh, 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 yes, if you cannot increase it in giving estrogen, what we do, we give estrogen then vaginal because it will have uh, it will uh, increase the, uh, the size of the endometrium better than you give it orally and if you don't have a good uh, endometrium you can freeze your embryo and you prepare your uh, endometrium later and uh, do uh, yes thank you, you have, and uh, i have uh, some comment for the lh uh, recently uh, the problem if you have an increase of lh what will you do <laughs> Uh, I, I personally
simply do something with LHI, do progesterone routinely. We use uh, most of the time antagonist protocol. And uh, we have sometimes an increase in LH. Recently, I have a patient who have a very short uh, natural cycle, and she increased her LH very early. I expected when doing my ultrasound, so I, uh, I do my pickup uh, earlier. I, I get half the oocyte, and the others were starting ovulating. I, I, sent, uh, I let her come 24 hours after the SCG, and uh, I pick my eggs. Unfortunately, she didn't get pregnant. The problem uh, of LH uh, is, 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 is a problem, but uh, it's rarely, rarely increased. We present recently in the paper at the ISHRAE, and it was accepted uh, comparing uh, antagonist protocol with, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the antagonist and another protocol using the three pills to give us the same results. So it's very cheap and it's good to use. I think Dr. Rafa Abu Habib has a question. Hi. Hello, Rafa. Can you hear me? Thank you for my question is to Dr. Habib. Are you aware of any studies comparing the dose of HCG, recombinant HCG, and GRH for trigger versus the risk of multiple gestations? I mean, if you adjust for the number. I'm not sure I, I got the whole question and Atash uh, so uh, so uh, usually if you want to do the trigger so you can the uh, the same dose of the HCG the recombinant HCG that we use uh, so 250 microgram along with the uh, 0 0.2 uh, so you can do them both together uh, now, uh, there are some variations where you give the GnRH agonist for trigger, and uh, they, uh, you know, but uh, but uh, most centers are doing them together at the same time. Some some even have done a study, uh, but there was you do the GnRH agonist uh, with the HCG, and then 12 hours later again you do another. But there is no uh, that was uh, of statistical statistics that will change your It's not. Uh, for multiple gestation, uh, I think uh, uh, it will depend on the uh, whether you are uh, going to do a single embryo transfer or not. And, uh, and I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, if it's based on the trigger or not. It's more about like what are we going to, how many embryos we're going to replace. If, if that was not, please uh, let me know and cut while you're asking that. Uh, there's a question for Eli. Uh, what do you think about the um, long protocol, modified long protocol for poor responders? In other words, that you were agonist a week before the expected period, you stop at the time of the period and you continue with um, uh, HMG FSH simulation alone, modified LUTL for poor responders. Really? Eliab, we lost you. Eli, I think we lost the connection. If you have other questions until Eli reconnects with us. Hello. Yes, now we have you. Okay, we're listening to you. Uh, can you repeat a little bit the question at the end? I don't. So the, the question is, um, what do you think about a modified uh, long protocol, GRH agonist long protocol in, for poor responders? So modified meaning that you start on uh, day 20, you continue until the first day of the menstruation, and then you stop your agonist suppression and continue with uh, FSH simulation alone. 
it's important it's important uh, Ellie, we lost you again. Hello. Yeah, it's, now we have you. It's, it's important, uh, the cycle, physiologically, when we have poor this but because we a premature age uh, surge, if you want, um, uh, increase of FLA, FSH before, before the period, when we have, we have this decalage of, F, of FSA. So it's important when we give uh, this is to to uh, uh, shift this uh, curve of FSH to the to the period and then to start. It could be a good uh, a good protocol. I don't have a personal experience in this, but uh, physiologically it could be a uh, it could work very much because it deplays the, L, the FSH to the follicle phase and then uh, we have a better recruitment of eggs and better response. Yeah. It's like, like a little bit like when we give the antagonist, somebody give antagonist in, in luteal phase, and then it start again, it's uh, as pre-treatment if you want. It could when we have responded. Uh, you know, Eli, uh, for those of us who have been long enough here around, um, at one point of time, the antagonist was not available. Like, uh, one way to deal with poor responders was to use the modified luteal, which was Alamod at the time. And the whole concept is that the agonist will cause, as you mentioned very nicely, downregulation of receptors at the level of the theory. And for this matter, if you give it for one week, you, you get the flare and the luteal phase, but then after that, because of downregulation, you still have suppression of LH and prevention of premature ovulation. So the concept is the less you suppress the system with uh, endogenous LH suppression, the more the system will be reactive and responsive to your treatment. So I think that's the whole concept. But again, I have stopped using it because as you mentioned, the uh, data have shown whether you use the agonist or the agonist, uh, uh, the final outcome for poor responders is, is unchanged. And no matter what you do for poor responders, there's no ideal treatment. I, I, I agree with Johnny. Uh, I use it also a long time ago. I call it the Jones protocol. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it was described at the end of the 90s, and uh, since the antagonist come, we stopped to use it. Yes. Yeah. I have the same uh, experience. Absolutely. Thank you. Let's see if we still have questions. So is the rate of success with women having PCOS? You see this? This question. Uh... Yeah, the question is unclear. Um, would you like to rephrase it for PCOS? It depends on age, depends on the of other factors. It cannot give, uh, yeah. but maybe it's, it's uh, like a uh, normal responder if, uh, if it's well uh, stimulated. So although um, um, during a stimulated cycle, many of us uh, are still, despite the lack of evidence in favor of gastra, any form of oil during uh, the luteal phase, we're sometimes compelled because we, we always try to create our own recipes whenever we have a thin endometrium to go of estrogen. But yet we know that randomized trial score of randomized trials and probably one of the most powerful meta-analysis of randomized trials have shown beyond any doubt that any estrogen supplementation poor responders high responders thin endometrium or not not be helpful but i do it but it's important to uh, acknowledge the evidence that that giving estradiol does not at all give you a, of a better outcome i'd be thinking about I have. Uh, I, I didn't use it a lot. I know that in your center you are losing a lot of estradiol uh, in the luteal phase support. Uh, but I personally didn't have any experience. I didn't use estrogen, uh, adding estrogen after fresh IVF cycle. So the evidence was never clear. So 
I didn't move to this slide. Yes. Let's see if we still have any questions before maybe we conclude. And this is just everyone. If you want to go back to these uh, presentations, they're all registered and you can go back on YouTube and listen to them at your leisure or share them with a friend who could not make it. Eli, do you have any kind of conclusive remarks you want to share it to the audience? Um, no, I think uh, thank you for the, this uh, webinar. It was very nice. Uh, the final message uh, it's only that in IVF uh, we don't have a magic protocol. It's a uh, it's a uh, we should individualize the treatment, and for every patient uh, we can choose uh, a a special uh, protocol. And at the end, uh, as uh, Mr. Hugh say, c'est là la probabilité. We have always the probability in all of this uh, protocol. Thank you Although very much. Just to create a little bit of controversy, I'm more for standardization. I think we, uh, we cannot individualize enough. I think we. Uh, we give ourselves the impression we're individualizing because we look smarter, all of us in our practice. But in fact, I think uh, 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 organized standardization will be the best. That is just today whether to add LH or not. And we haven't solved this one. Since there's no harm in adding LH, why not adding it anyway, right? Uh, we uh, sometimes lose control. But if you, no matter what you predict, but if you're taking doing the antagonist, you always know that you will not lose cycle cancer this. So you can standardize a protocol and know that no matter what happens to you, the patient is safe and the cycle is salvaged. You can even not use any estradiol, and studies have shown that estradiol is not very helpful. And then you'll be totally safe if you simply do a count of follicles and you have an antagonist protocol. And at the same time, uh, a progesterone level on the day of trigger would be probably more useful in responders where the number of are very precious and embryos are very precious to see if we want to replace them in a fresh cycle or not. So to my mind, uh, it, People who want to publish on individualization and getting more complex, whereas I can see that things are getting simpler and simpler. And with time, we're going into a more uniform one protocol that fits most of the patients. What do you think, Eli? Uh, not only to, uh, to say something, what I mean in individualization, uh, it's that for every pathology, we must treat, for example, when we have endometriosis and myosis, it's very important to, 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 to give the agonist because it will help not only the response, but on the, the implantation. Uh, but when we have this, uh, if I, I like, uh, the agonist protocol, I cannot give for all my patient agonist protocol. I, I would try to give antagonist because it's more safe, it would decrease the uh, OH. Uh, I want only this uh, issue. Uh, uh, for, for, for every pathology, we can try a protocol that we think it's better. Perhaps, as you say, it, it's a question of probability. There is uh, nothing. Uh, uh, one hundred percent clear, but we try to 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 uh, increase the chances. Yeah. Eli, we have a fellowship at AUB, and we always claim in front of the fellows that we individualize you all. But in terms to uh, to to practicality, you can always standardize a protocol that's safe and effective. But for example, let me since we are trying to create some interest here. Um, <coughs> We have learned through randomized trials over the past 20 years and by recommendation of all societies that when you have advanced endometriosis, you give them the agonist for three months and you improve the outcome. Well, we know this is not true anymore. 
because the data are 20 years old from poor randomized trials. And what's coming up today does not work necessarily that, that outcome. And so medicine is, c'est une ingratitude. Huh? And so you go through a phase and uh, we're taught by our mentors, we teach our purpose, and then it goes back, fortunately, this is the problem with poor evidence. Um, so yeah, just any, Tia, do you have any comments? Um, no, I, I think uh, what you said is very true. I think uh, uh, maybe 50% of what we learn in medical school will turn out to be wrong. So, uh, and that's why uh, webinars like these should continue. And uh, yeah. I think it's a great way to, uh, to keep uh, in reading uh, and learning from each other yeah. and uh, from people's experiences. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I agree. And I think you know, you follow all the innovations in the field, you see how there's the peak of everyone adopts them and how 90% of our innovations fall into the water. And so I think sometimes being wise, uh, adopting consciously uh, is probably the best way, general, right? And I think that was this, this whole webinar was all about, is to tell people, you know, this is the base. All of three of you have focused on the base. The thing comes up, goes in and goes out. It's something you have to be cautious and in adopting. Ahmad, do you have any conclusive remarks? No, I, I agree with you. It's like COVID. Uh, I hear some comments saying that what I say today uh, will be wrong tomorrow. <laughs> We're changing every 24 hours and <laughs> learning new things in IVF. It's not every 24, but every six months or years, <laughs> they have different, different things. Yes, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Well, nice webinar, George. Uh, good uh, to continue. And, uh, <laughs> Very good uh, initiative. <laughs> thank you for everyone. Thank you, George, for putting this together. Uh, thank you for our partners, all the participants who... Um, George, you want to add anything or shall we conclude? Just I want to uh, thank uh, all the attendees to be with us tonight and hope they enjoy our webinar. I want to thank uh, all the Dr. Sniper. Dr. Jaudi, Dr. Peter, for uh, the clear and useful presentation. And sure, uh, thanks uh, for Dr. Awad uh, for all the, his efforts in this webinar. Big thanks for IPSA uh, and its team, Lebanon, who help us to make this webinar happen. Thanks for Science Pro also for its technical support. We are waiting for you for a next webinar. It will be on the 27th of May. It will be fertility preservation. So next, uh, in two weeks, Wednesday at five o'clock also, it will be sponsored by Merck. And thank you again to be with us tonight and good evening, Ramadan Karim. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.